Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. I'd much rather have a silly voice and a funny haircut and, and a, a funny walk because sure. A, I'm better at it and B, hmm. it's, it's a mask. It's a, you're someone else. And so I find I don't get self-conscious. Hello in the envelope, listener. Testing one, two, three. I'm back in the closet record audio for this week's episode featuring the one and only Hugh Grant. I'm so thrilled to welcome Hugh Grant on the podcast. I have, of course, been a huge fan of his for basically my whole life. I've seen so many of his classic romantic comedies and have been so impressed by his more recent performances. From Florence Foster Jenkins onward, I would say Hugh Grant has really been showing audiences kind of a new side of him, which he's talked about plenty, including um, in his backstage cover story, which we will link to in today's episode description and article. But it was really cool to talk to Hugh in the context of that and in the context of, of acting, because of course, he talked about process, 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 all things, you know, creative process, creating characters across his whole career, across the many genres that he's worked in. And of course, the precise preparation and then how to let that all go on set or even in an audition, Um, how to make each take fresh. He had really, really insightful things to say on that, especially in comedy, which is, of course, difficult to pull off. And he speaks of like the importance of conviction, especially in romantic comedy, a genre of which he is a master. And he has great stuff to say on character actor parts, the challenges or benefits of um, playing someone who's really far from yourself which for Hugh, you know, he knows himself and he knows what works quite well. And that's partly because of like what the industry has taught him. I really appreciate how frank he is about the kind of fickle nature of the industry. Like even someone as big as Hugh Grant has, of course, been subjected to lulls and to changing tastes and whims. Um, He speaks about kind of the hiatus he took after 2009's Did You Hear About the Morgans? But that's the thing, is after that hiatus, he came back with Florence Foster Jenkins' Paddington 2, one of my favorite performances, like, ever. A very English scandal, and now this year he has The Gentleman and The Undoing. And this is really just a new era. This is proof, this is proof, actors, that you don't have to be pigeonholed. Or if you are pigeonholed, there are wonderful things to come from that, of course. But there are also ways to pivot and to surprise audiences. So it was really cool to hear about that. Um, Quick note about The Undoing, HBO's limited series opposite Nicole Kidman. Uh, It's kind of a whodunit mystery. If you are someone who has not seen The Undoing and is hoping to and planning on seeing The Undoing, we could not do a spoiler-free version of this interview, which which took place the day after the finale aired for uh, The Undoing. So... Those of you who have seen The Undoing understand why I'm kind of tiptoeing around this. If you have not seen the finale of The Undoing and you are planning to and you don't want to be spoiled, I would actually recommend not listening to this until you do see the show. Uh, Because it's a twisty, turny show and and Hugh uh, had to speak about his character in a way that made sense with the finale. So I will leave it at that. Let's get to it. Please stick around for Christine McKenna Torella's backstage casting insider segment, as always. These segments are are great for those of you using Backstage to find work. I hope you are taking notes, either mental notes or actual notes, during Christine's segments because she is just spelling out exactly how you need to operate through every step of the industry, tying it into these interviews. This week, she speaks of this new series, actually, of classes called the Actors Toolkit. It's a very exciting development over from the Backstage team, so please stick around for that. And without further ado, I am so pleased 
to introduce Hugh Grant to the podcast. Hey, if you are an actor or an aspiring actor, someone at the beginning of your artistic career, and you haven't signed up for Backstage yet and you don't know how it works, I have good news for you. Backstage is offering 30 whole days completely free just for our In the Envelope listeners. If you visit backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope, you will have full access to the site where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start applying to the thousands of casting notices uploaded every single day on the world's number one casting platform. Again, we are giving listeners of this podcast 30 days completely free to try out Backstage. Go to checkout, that's backstage.com slash subscribe, and enter the code ENVELOPE. If you want to be in contention for an Emmy or for an Oscar or for a Tony or for a SAG Award, do as many of the guests on this podcast have suggested and use Backstage. We are here for you. Again, free 30-day trial, backstage.com slash subscribe. Enter the code ENVELOPE. Era-defining movie star Hugh Grant has evolved through different phases during his 30-plus years in the biz. Since his breakout in Morris and Four Weddings and a Funeral, and classic romantic comedies including Notting Hill and Bridget Jones's Diary, the BAFTA and Golden Globe winners' recent performances subvert audience expectations, from Florence Foster Jenkins to Paddington 2 to his Emmy-nominated A Very English Scandal. This year, he pivots again in Guy Ritchie's film The Gentleman and David E. Kelly's HBO limited series opposite Nicole Kidman, The Undoing. Here's our chat with the legendary Hugh Grant. Thank you, Hugh. Hi, how are you? Groovy. You? Groovy. Good. I'm, uh, you know, hanging in there. The end of 2020 is in sight, so that's yeah. good. Do you like doing press like this? Do you like not having to go to premieres or? Uh, no, I, uh, I've always rather enjoyed press tours. Ah. If, as long as the film's good and people like it, it's terrible <laughs> okay. when it's a dog. But when it's a good film and the studio likes it and you're whizzing around on a private jet and staying in expensive hotels, it's right up my alley. Sure, that does sound But this is, this is weird. I've never done a post-mortem before. Um, oh, okay. Oh. That yeah, doesn't really it's... happen in the film world. It's, I think it's a telly thing. Right. Sure. And it's so fascinating to talk to you today, right after the finale of this show aired. I'd love to ask you about it. As you know, we're backstage. As you, as you, I think you know, we're all about the craft and career advice. So I, of course, will be asking you all about, all about the specifics of your process and your inspirations and all of that. But in terms of The Undoing, should we speak about it with like a spoiler version or a spoiler-free version? I think we can do spoiler Okay. Now. Great. <laughs> so I think that um, the definition of a good twist, especially in like a murder mystery thriller TV series, is a twist that you, no one predicts, but it's still believable. And I think The Undoing pulled that off because I don't think anybody predicted this ending. Is that right? Well, I mean, I, I, I had like seven theories and none of them were how it turned out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I, I noticed from watching Twitter throughout the ah. broadcast over six weeks that people just assumed it can't be Jonathan because that's too obvious, you know. <laughs> and so I was nervous that episode six would be in some way disappointing to them. Oh. Uh, but having read Twitter last night, uh, it looked like people quite enjoyed it. Yes. Um, did you know from the beginning was the script, I mean, because especially for a long form project, you as an actor would prefer to know whether or not you did it in a whodunit, right? I, I couldn't have done it. A project any other way it seems to me impossible mm. to do something where you don't know where your character is going or if they're guilty or innocent Gosh. and not only that but a distinguished project though it was i'm not sure i'd have wanted to play jonathan if he was just mm. a guy who'd slept with the wrong woman once and then spent the six episodes apologizing but it was very interesting sure. to play a, a, a psychopathic killer yes oh so you okay so i want to ask you about that because do you consider him a psychopath, first of all? Yes, I did okay. once get into the distinctions between psychopath and sociopath, and I can't mm. remember exactly what they are. But he's, yes, that's what he is. And, and you know, the, the, one of the most important questions for me about him was, does he actually love Grace and Henry? Or is it 
it's his narcissism so profound. It's really just mm. he's in love with them loving him. And oh. I'm afraid it was the latter. Oh, it was. Okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I think for me as a viewer, I never questioned that he loved his family. But if we're talking about a personality disorder like this, mm. I mean, did you go into, you went into the almost medical diagnoses yeah. of these things? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But more, it's kind of more useful than that is just um, real life examples uh, that one okay. sort of sees around one. And you think you, you're you very plausible and you're rather charming, but you're just profoundly, profoundly narcissistic and mm. selfish. And, and, I, and, I, and you scare me. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up yeah. slightly. I've met mm. these people. Oh, interesting. Based on real people and based on, on reading. Yeah. And... and 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 the difficulty with this show was, uh, uh, you know, you, your your show goes out to a lot of actors, and and actors mm. know their their first duty is to be true to their character. Mm. Um, they get lost if they're not, and it doesn't work if they're not. But if I'd been absolutely true to who Jonathan was, a man who was having an affair, hadn't had his hadn't been going to work for three months, mm. uh, I would have reacted. For instance, at the uh, fundraiser in episode one, when Eleanor turns up stalking mm. my wife, mm. I would have had to play some anxiety, some schwitz ah, there. Uh, but I absolutely couldn't for the sake of the show, huh. because you can't give stuff away. But actually, I found that I could combine the two obligations because I couldn't wreck the show and I needed to be true to the character. So that meant that the character had to be a brilliant sociopath, so adept and okay. supple and able to cover anything uh, convincingly. That's why I, I just uh, assumed he was one of the most extreme examples you can find of a uh, highly intelligent, highly dangerous sociopath. Which does explain why you would be more interested in this ending than some ending where he, where it ended up being somebody else who did it because you as an actor are asking questions about the character and you're asking, how can he be so calm at this fundraiser? The conclusion must be he's very, very good at lying to the point of- Yes, and always has been. Yes. And always has been, yeah. Yeah, the born and again, like that. You, you can't know that until, I mean, you would prefer to know the whole arc for something like, if The Undoing were several seasons, with an ambiguous ending, you can't paint yourself into a corner with this character, right? No, exactly that's that. that's harder. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Um, what would you say, I wanna ask about your, I guess, artistic process, and maybe we can use the undoing as the example. First of all, are there things that you do for every role to prepare? I know you do a lot of backstory, and you yeah. treat rehearsal differently than you treat the day of shooting. Yes, I... I uh... I go through the script with a, a sort of absurd, mm. absurdly fine tooth comb mm. again and again and again. Why do I say this? Why do I ask for coffee, not tea? Or, mm. uh, why do I really think of that character? Have I ever met that waiter before? Have I been to this restaurant before? You know, mm. um, and that way you gradually build up an ever mushrooming biography. And you might come in and change bits, but it keeps growing and growing and growing till it's many, many pages long. And I just find that it helps to bed me down and I, I know where I am and uh, in, in terms of who the character is. And then more importantly, what I've just discovered over the years is that I never want to be in front of a camera feeling what the British actors called eggy. Uh, which means you have egg on your face where you just, <laughs> I don't know what I'm thinking. I don't know what I'm supposed to act here. It very often happens between lines. You know, I say my line, then three other people have lines and the camera's still on you. Yeah. And it could be quite a long time. It could be a page. It could be two pages mm. in the trial sequence. It's f***ing pages long of me just reacting. Mm. And mm. that takes, I have found it really helps to literally write a script, a thought script, Okay. And at this moment, you're probably thinking this, then it segues into this, then it segues into this. Now, you might change it on the day, but okay. what, because you've got it in your head, you're never going to be um, self-consciously blank, eggy darling, as we say. Yeah, no. <laughs> and you say that's especially for the, for the silent moments. You're basically writing your, your own screen directions. Yes, 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 or script of thoughts, yeah. Fascinating. Thoughts and motivations. And, and it might be, you might have different versions of it, you know. 
you sure. could be thinking this, you could be thinking this, or you could be thinking this, but at least you've got something. And I'm not, you're not having to on the day think, Christ, what's happening here? Um, right. But you might change it on the day, but it's just useful, I find, to have these things in the, in the background. What might change it on the day? Well, you don't know how the other person's going to perform it. The other you don't okay. know if suddenly, you know, writer, director suddenly come in and say, well, let's cut this bit. Or let's change this bit, you know. So things change. As every right. anyone who's been on a film set knows that you know it's full of changes. The surprises coming at you in all angles. Uh, we're going to hurry. Let's shoot this in one shot, or uh, you know, okay. we're going to do this outside now. Or you know, there's a big scene at the end of episode two when I turn up again, suddenly out of the blue on the porch at the, the beach house, and I sort of thought, yeah, okay, that's a big scene. I'll probably shoot that most of the day. I get to the set, and Susanna Beer says. It's going to be so cool when the sun goes down. Let's do it in Magic Hour. The sunset? Which, yeah, which is like one hour to wow. shoot a whole scene from every angle, of a very emotional, difficult scene. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, um, film acting is just full of horrible surprises and you, you've got to be ready. <laughs> right. So over-preparing, but not to the point that you're frozen in whatever it is you've... Prepared. Well, that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing. There's preparation, which I think is good. And then there's rehearsed, which I think is on the whole bad. And uh, mm. I think in my early years, I, I fell into the trap of sort of rehearsing in front of a mirror and thinking, well, that's good. That's the way to say that line. Okay. And then when you get on the set, you just try and repeat what you did in front of a mirror. It never really works. And even if you do get it the same as in front of a mirror, it's sort of dead. The correct preparation is so that you're, when you're in front of the camera, you invent it absolutely fresh. Right. And th- those lines, so that those line readings really are as though, as though it's the first time. Now, yes, and and you take it off the other actor. I mean, that's the that's the really big thing. Mm. If you can ache yourself, listen, I've never heard this before. And Mike Newell, who directed uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral, mm-hmm. he was very. His mantra was never before, darlings, never before. And it's quite a difficult thing to do if you've already done it from six different angles with five takes mm-hmm. in each. So now it's mm-hmm. the fortieth time you've done it, including the rehearsals. And you have to imagine, uh, this is this scene has never happened before. I don't know what she's going to say now, and I don't know what he's going to say. It's really hard. It's a magic trick, yeah. Yeah. Is that, but if you don't how, do that, it, it, you, you look rehearsed. Right. And your whole goal is to, not, is to not deliver a line. You have said that you have watched your performances, and you can tell which lines have been rehearsed and which feel more spontaneous. Yeah, I can a bit, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and it's one of the reasons why um, I quite like improvising. Because if the, if I feel like the scene's going a bit stale, let's change it. Let's say something different. If a different thought comes into my head, say that instead of the scripted line. Mm. And then if you've got if you're working with you know good actors, they love it and they pick it up and they might yeah. say something different back. And uh, I learned that the very first time I did a, a film in America, because in Britain, perhaps because of budget, uh, we're much more strict and sort of uh, schoolmistressy about the whole thing. Well, that's the script, darling. You have to say the script. Oh, okay. But in America, everyone's improvising all around the script, especially in comedies. And uh, it's terrific. And it right. really suits film, I think. So that is one of the ways that your maybe process or maybe style has evolved. First of all, I want to ask, do you have those those big bulks of pages of backstory? Do you have those for roles going back years? Uh, I do have the old script folders, which have quite a few pages of the, the biography in them. But in uh-huh. recent years, they've all, it's all been on an iPhone. It's those yellow pages, you know. Sure. Phoenix Buchanan biog, and it goes <laughs> on for pages after page after page. Even Phoenix had a biog. And these are never to be, you will never share these, right? Um, they must be such a fascinating No, I, I, I mean, it makes process. me feel a little weird even talking the way we're talking now. Because <laughs> sure. in a way, I think uh, mysteries yeah. are good. Yeah. And you as an actor, you want secrets. You you want to be able to hold on to something that is... Well, just mysterious. about the character. If the character is a bit mysterious, it's quite nice to leave it mysterious. I, yeah. I'm delighted to talk about, you know, acting. Well, of course. And how? so how often do you think, maybe this is a big general question, but how often do you think about audience expectations? Lit, like including their perceptions of you and the roles they've already seen you in. How much do you go into a role thinking, I'm going to, I know their expectations and I want to subvert it? I'm not sure I do that exactly. That I have, I, 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 for some reason, I have been a bit frustrated that, um, 
you know, quite often people say, oh, Hugh Grant, he's a romantic comedy guy, you know, he's got fluffy <laughs> hair and does, uh, the, you know, sort of dithering Englishman, bumbling Englishman. Hmm. Fine, I did do that a few times, quite a few times. And I'm proud of those films, but I, right. it's, it's frustrating to think people think that's all I do. And uh, so I've done quite a lot of things that are not like that in the last six years. And, um, and then, you know, you get frustrated because they actually went quite well, but not that many people saw them. And uh, ah. I mean, they did, they did all right, but that's why this, this one's quite nice for me because this is quite a popular show. Right. And um, it sort of reaches audiences that the others didn't reach. And I think it's safe to say this is probably the the character that is the least like those romantic comedies. Well, I, I, yeah, in some ways it is. Although, for instance, the the last one I did, the um, the Guy Ritchie film, The Gentleman, is yes, pretty dramatically different as well. Oh yes, yes, yeah. and that that see that also makes me ask the question of like you disguised your eyes, your hair is slicked back. That accent is jaw dropping. It's, it's such an amazing performance. I think if nobody knew anything about you, they would still consider it a, a great standout scene-stealing performance. So I don't know how much you're calibrating, like, I would like to do this because it's different. I definitely thought that would be fun. And, and the thing is, uh, I, I started my whole life uh, as an actor doing silly voices, doing characters. Mm. I, I was never doing leading man stuff where I was anything like myself. Right. I had a, a little comedy group called the Jockeys of Norfolk. We did sketches. We wrote uh, TV stuff. We, we performed lots of radio ads and it was all silly characters. And mm. if anyone had ever said to me, you know, what, 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 if someone said, what can Hugh, Hugh do? They said, oh, he does the silly voices. So when I got segued mm. after Morris, into leading man stuff. I was never entirely comfortable, to be really honest with you. And uh, I'd much rather have a, a silly voice and a funny haircut and, and a, a funny walk. Because sure. uh, A, I'm better at it, and B, hmm. it's, it's a mask. It's a, you're someone else. And so I find I don't get self-conscious. Okay. When the part's nearer to oneself and the camera is looming in on a, on a dolly towards you, you can, you can get self-conscious. Hmm. But I, I couldn't if I'm Jeremy Thorpe or Phoenix Buchanan because I'm someone else. So I, because this is this is so great because I've always considered leading man or leading actor and character actor to be the sort of two categories, and you you've done both, as you say. What what would you say is your definition of a character actor? What does that mean to you? Well, I, I'm not entirely sure of these terms, but to me, I, it just means um, further from yourself. Now, there's nothing wrong with using bits of yourself in a, in a leading part. In fact, I think it's advisable. If you see someone do a massive character role in a leading part, it's mm. quite dangerous, mm. especially in the cinema. You, your face is huge on the screen, gotcha. mm. and you see you can see the acting, unless they're geniuses. Gary Oldman can do it. Daniel Day-Lewis can do it. Ah. But it can be dangerous, I think. It's fine in smaller parts, but in lead parts... Sometimes it can be di distracting. You see the acting. And so then I think it's okay to bring bits of yourself. Mm. Um, it can actually breathe some life into it. You know, uh, Cary Grant brought bits mm. of himself. Uh, uh, Jimmy Stewart, I think. Uh, Paul Newman, even. Mm. Sort of their off-screen persona infuses their, their leading man roles. I think so. Yeah. I think so. But as I say, I, that's, it's, it's, uh, you've got to be an extremely confident person mm. to present great hunks of yourself, great parts of your personality, and not feel self-conscious. I do feel a bit self-conscious if I do right. that. And I, that's why I'm happier. You know, I put in on a uh, little funny voice or something or, or <laughs> fake lenses. I'm someone else. And then I can't be self-conscious. You know? Is self-consciousness the ultimate fear like, yeah. what, is the, what is the danger? That's death. That's it's death, death, I think. Okay. You fear that dolly <laughs> shot up to close where you have nothing to, nothing yes. to provide. Yes, that's, that's the terror. That's the terror. <laughs> Does that terror also come from, this goes back to the watching yourself in roles. Do you watch yourself in roles like behind with your, you know, shielding your eyes almost? 
I know now from experience that uh, the first time I see a rough cut or an early cut, uh, I'm going to want to kill myself. You just have to prepare (laughs) for it. Okay. And somehow get through that day and watch it again, and it'll be pretty bad the next day. And uh, about the fourth or fifth time, you're through it. And, um, Hmm. And then a different problem sets in when I've been quite closely involved with the editing process is that I, I just can't distinguish anything. I, I'm, I'm useless at it. The only way I can do it mm. is to bring a stranger in, any stranger. It could be the cleaning lady, bring her in from the hall, make her watch the cut. Suddenly you see the whole film for what it really is and, and your performance mm. for what it really is. Otherwise, you, you, you know, you've just been too close to it for too long. It means nothing. I see. And is that also a thing of like asking that person, do you believe Every moment, are you believing? Well, them? you might ask them. You might. Okay. But actually, what happens just their very presence in the room, I find, makes you mm. see the thing through their eyes, cool. which is how you need to see it. Yes, especially after never, the, never before, darling. Thing, you know, suddenly never before, it's, right? Yeah, yeah. Not after. I mean, writing pages and pages and pages that puts you in your head, and so the whole point of filming onward yeah. is to get yourself out of yourself to be yeah. able to have some distance. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, is that easier or harder with this idea of like, I almost think of it as how many degrees away from you yourself is each character? Or is it more like a, um, I think of Cloud Atlas, like Cloud Atlas is possibly the furthest from you yourself. Is that more or less difficult or? No, well, for me, it's easier and more fun. Okay. And that's why when I I was preparing this part, Hmm. um, having enjoyed very much recently doing more character stuff further away from myself i i thought this is the way f- to do this part i even thought about uh, playing it american uh, mm. as it was originally written mm. and this is when i also created this whole story about france and all blah 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 and i wanted a strange look with uh, a certain kind of hair and a certain kind of wardrobe and uh, it was susanna beer who Mm. very politely chucked all that out the window. Okay. She wanted <laughs> plenty of Hugh Grant because she thought that I brought something which would mean people think it just can't be him. It can't be him. Fascinating. Which mm. is the goal in this in this specific story is we don't want to think it was you. No, but then on second viewing or in retrospect looking back you got to think yeah I see I see yes oh, yeah. he, he is a killer. The so the first episode it's, it's is completely delicate. different now. After yeah, 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 yeah. This is fascinating. Um, so this idea of the typecasting, we're all about advice for actors. Yes. And you did not, you could never have, no one can predict their acting career, but you could have never predicted this, as you say, segue into leading man. Yeah. What is your advice for actors who, maybe they're not segued into, you know, leading man in huge films or whatever, maybe they're, maybe they're pigeonholed as quirky character actors and they get stuck in that role like what is your advice to get out of it i mean actors do not have a lot of say in that process yeah well i i I suppose the first thing i'd say is i would give advice that i have not followed myself which is that if you have any ability at all to write or produce your own stuff Hmm. do it uh i think that's the best way anyone can break out of being stuck in an acting rut and and also i just think it's healthy and um, fulfilling rather than waiting around for the phone to ring. And uh, uh, looking back, I think there's sadly no substitute at all for working, especially when it comes to uh, film and television. I don't know if any of that can be taught. You've just got to get in there and suffer. And I really suffered the first few things I did. I was so bad and so self-conscious and I had no idea what was happening. I remember I was shooting something and, and I, I did a take and just went back to base. We were way, actually way out on sea ice in Canada because I thought that was it. I'd shot my, my scene, but of course it was one angle, one take. And uh, I just didn't even know technically how filming worked. So right. I just think uh, familiarizing oneself with that environment and that process mm-hmm. um, helps. And, and so much of... Uh, Acting, I think, is is learning tricks. It's a bit like uh, cooking in the kitchen. You know, you learn to oh yeah how to uh, cook a uh, slice an onion without it making you cry. Mm-hmm. And I just learned some basic tricks with film acting that made huge differences. Like only six years ago, I learned to do quite hard exercise the morning before I shoot. 
okay. um, get up, it means getting up horribly early uh, but and running in the dark or whatever hmm. but it's life changing because hmm. it brings down these terrible levels of um, stress hormone oh. adrenaline and suddenly I can be calmer in my face and calmer in my body and think thoughts better so li- little tricks like that uh, massively helped and, and really 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 knowing the lines I, I copied that mm. from um, Anthony Hopkins and Gene Hackman did it and I did a film with him you'd always see them going over and over and over their lines and uh, then you're free you're never going to forget them you don't you never want to be struggling for the line right I've, I've been there and I've seen other actors do it and suddenly you know the ums and ers come in and I, I've been very guilty of that sure yeah. How do you memorize lines? Is there, are there specific techniques there? Um, well, I think, again, I had a, a very good uh, theatre director once who, uh, he, he was very keen. His catchphrase was, don't nest, darling, don't nest, which means don't fall, don't, don't, yeah, don't fall in love with a way of saying something. Okay. Uh, and he would say during rehearsal for this play, Oh, don't be good now. Don't be good. Just, just be bad. Oh, just be yeah. bad. Just think thoughts, and um, so you're not settling into a performance that you then repeat. It's a bit like what I was saying earlier. Right. So you, you, you know, you, you you use the book for quite a long time. You use the script, and so a lot, a lot of it's going in by osmosis and just thoughts. And then I, I and then I think, for me anyway, the process is you never learn lines. You you learn thoughts. Why do I say this? What would I say? I cover up the previous line. Mm. So I cover up my line and I read the, the, the other person's line. Okay, what would I say here? And quite often it's quite similar to what's written. Gotcha. And so you've half learned the line anyway because you've learned the thought. If it isn't similar to what you think, then you have to, why, why do I say what's written? Yeah. And, then, and, and also, at what point does that thought come into my head? Because it's very often... Not mm. after they've spoken; it's while they're speaking, mm. and that can be very, that's a very useful trick because then you can come in hard in on your cue, which exactly. the camera loves and the, the the drama loves because it moves, it clicks along. You sometimes see actors wait for the other actor to finish, and then they think, right. "Right now, here we go. I'm going to do my thinking and my emoting, and then I speak, and the whole thing becomes so turgid. It's impossible to act. Very often, you know, I think when people speak, they the thought is coming while the other one's speaking and right. you can snap in or cut them off or, you know, right. all those rules. That's things. why maybe in your script you have, you have pinpointed in the middle of someone's line rather than the end of yeah, it. Yeah, very much so. epiphany. Yeah, 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 yeah. And ideally, again, it's not that the page is your script script that is going to dictate every take. It's that you no. can get there organically in the moment because of that preparation. Yes. I probably sound very contradictory because I talk about intense preparation, but I also talk about not being pre-rehearsed, but I do believe But it does have to be both. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I think so. I mean, like a ballet dancer, they are rehearsed to death. Mm -hmm. But I bet you they they would say when they're out there, they're just listening to the music and trying to be as free as possible. And I know that concert pianists, you know, practice, 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 a really hard piece by list, Mm. impossible fingering, but they've got it. It goes down deep into them so that then when they're out there, they can feel and breathe the music. It's a combination of um, technique and inspiration. And is it safe to say you've you've taken on roles where you have not been able to do as much preparation as you would like? Um, <laughs> Sometimes no, shooting not re- schedules. Not really, I can't. I can't okay. reach for that excuse for when I've been shit. I, <laughs> think I, I just. Uh, I don't know. To be honest, I think uh, very often I, the the part just didn't particularly suit me when I was really bad mm. and. Mm. Uh, I, I learned over the years better what kind of what I was had to offer as an actor. Right. This also a lot of this applies also to auditioning. But is it also safe to say that you haven't done much auditioning the further in your career you go? Well, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 that's the sort of weird protocol, isn't it? Right. At a certain point, you stop having to audition. So I, I haven't done an audition since Four Weddings and a Funeral. Okay. Um, and I feel sorry for filmmakers uh, who are faced with that because they're having to take a real punt in the dark. 
mm. and uh, hope that this actor can do it. That's why, actually, with uh, Guy Ritchie's film, The Gentleman, because I wasn't entirely sure I would be credible, I um, <laughs> he offered me the part, and I accepted. And then ah. I put myself on my iPhone doing various different versions of that character and sent it to him. Okay. And uh, he liked That's it, cool. so then I, then I sort of relaxed. But I, I, Tarantino, I know, makes everyone audition. doesn't matter how... Mm-hmm illustrious you are right well and that's sort of the, i think it's been said on this podcast too there is almost a trap you fall into where once you are once you are getting offered roles rather than auditioning is it likelier that you will be pigeonholed i mean is it likelier that people will cast you based only on what on their yeah, that's an interesting thought yeah or maybe well in my case i think a lot of it was about money uh, mm. People thought, "Ooh, who? well, Four Weddings made lots of money, so let's shove him in another romantic comedy." I see. Okay. And I uh, was weak and thought, "Yeah, lovely. Okay, well, you're offering me shit loads of money. I'll take that. Thank you very much." And <laughs> and after two or three of those, no, no one would ever think of offering you something different. Uh, exactly. So it's it's mainly my fault, greed and laziness. No, I mean that's the that's how the business is designed. Like the. It's been said on this podcast too. You have to make decisions based on your on making a living, right? No, I, I it, it really was greed. <laughs> and what good okay. actors do is yeah. they might do a big commercial thing in their wheelhouse, as they say in Hollywood, yeah. and then they would make something more interesting or something more challenging in between. Sure, and go between the two. But I just went wheelhouse, wheelhouse, wheelhouse. Yeah. Death. <laughs> yeah. But you've also you've also said that. Now that you are, I, I have the quote here. Now that I got old and ugly, that mm. that is what has enabled you yeah. to go outside the wheelhouse. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was partly that, and partly, uh, yes, the two things went hand in hand: old and ugly, and and um, my wheelhouse exploded in two thousand and nine. With did you hear about the Morgans, where I was yes. very well paid, and the film was expensive, and it was a you know a failure, and um, it was amazing. It was just yeah overnight. Hmm. There were no calls from heads of studios. It was gone. Yeah. A, a bit of a crisis of faith. Well, uh, it <laughs> coincided with me having got quite bored of the business anyway. But it was a, it was a, it was a difficult year because uh, having sort of always thought for, for many years, I, I, I feel tired and jaded with this work. Um, that's one thing. But to have it then taken away from you, oh, no, don't take it away. It didn't mean that. <laughs> so right. it was a bit it was a bit difficult but then as you say it's been nice to sort of slowly build it up again in a completely different way through the last 10 years mm. and it is all just further proof that the actor is among the least have amount, the least amount of agency in the whole filmmaking process you are you are at the mercies of forces beyond your control yeah which you, which as i say i think is a more avoidable than we think hmm Get off sure. your ass, write your thing, produce your thing. Because uh, we know great. a lot. We know a lot about what works. Mm-hmm. And um, scripts I've read by actors tend to be good. Dire- directors yeah. who are actors tend to be good. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there is a form of fear and laziness. I think, oh, just wait around for a nice fat part to land on my mat. Mm-hmm. I think well, one's got to get out there. And is it safe to say, too, that taking breaks is also... I mean, that maybe that's good advice too. Like, I really appreciate how frankly you talk about that that flop of a movie. I mean, that's mm. that frankness is very welcome. Well, I did take a break after that. I mean, I, I got very involved with politics in Britain, and yeah. that was lovely. After uh, whatever it was by then, um, twenty five years in the mm. business, doing entertainment, dealing with synthetic life all the time. Suddenly, I was dealing with real life, and mm. it was very bracing. And refreshing, because no one's up your ass in the world of politics in Britain. They're, they're, it's brutal, savage world, mm. and uh, it was great. Uh, and you know, your words are your words; they're not scripted. Um, right. So I enjoyed that. It kind of helps you get to know yourself better, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Which, of course, then can be used in 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 as material as as inspiration. From from Florence Foster Jenkins onwards, it seems it really is a new chapter, and I, I it must be that that hiatus informs that. 
Uh, maybe the, the hiatus helped. I think also uh, ha- having children helped me. Ah. Um, suddenly I, well, Stephen Frears always says, well, that's very but obviously you just grew up. You were a little boy before, <laughs> then you were a man. <laughs> and it's a little condescending, but, but I, there's some truth in it. That I was a bit of an overgrown sort of um, Peter Pan. Mm. Revolting, really, age of 40. But then I, uh, or 50, and then I had children and suddenly I, I, you just feel more centred and mm. you have access to all these emotions. As you, as they're all unleashed and, um, and, a, and a weird kind of centre in one's life that didn't yeah. exist before. I had no centre. Where, where was my centre? The golf course. Yeah, I feel like having kids is the ultimate getting out of your own way or getting out of your head. Yeah, well, it is. You, I mean, it's Warren Beatty said, you know, suddenly you're not number one anymore. And yeah. uh, I think that's quite important. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a dream role or a dream project or a dream co-star? Uh, I don't really. I mean, I at one time I, I had the sort of power to, you know, produce anything I wanted. And uh, I never did it because I, I just didn't have those impulses. I don't know what's wrong with me. But um, I know that I know the kind of tone I like best, and it exists somewhere between comedy and drama. Mm-hmm. I like things that are a little bit black. Um, I like things set in a pre-internet era. Mm. It's a Why is foible that? of mine. I don't know. I think life might have been considerably more textured and interesting. Mm. I f- feel like it's. Oh, uh, homo- uh, the internet and social media has homogenized us in some uh, scary way. Sure. Yeah. Before we all had cell phones, we lived more independent, interesting, and exciting, dangerous lives. I find that people are quite drawn to films and TV series mm-hmm. set pre nineteen ninety seven. Escapism, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, and now you know what is it? It's almost like. Um, well, especially now, romance. Can you have romance? I mean, hmm. some of my Down own films are now would be cancelled because they're not woke enough, you know. I pinched hmm. Bridget Jones's bum in, in the lift. Yes. And Bridget Jones, you couldn't have that now. Oh, well, you can't. That's a sexual harassment <laughs> in the workplace. <laughs> yeah, ideals evolve for, for yeah. better or for worse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned comedy and drama. I want to, I've always wanted to, I've like always wanted to ask you this maybe you especially you have said that comedy is harder than drama and i fully believe i've always believed that that comedy yeah. is much harder and much less likely to be like awarded and given trophies yeah um is it would you agree with the idea that romantic comedy is the hardest of all romantic comedy as a genre it seems fluffy and shallow but acting in it it's like an impossible task to convince us of those kinds of, as you say, real life romantic stakes. Well, I, I suppose romantic comedies are somewhat formulaic, and uh, uh-huh. you know they meet, they fall in love, there's a parting, and then they come together again. Yes. And uh, I suppose whenever you're dealing in formula, um, it's difficult to keep it all f- fresh and uh, believable and exciting, mm. and. Uh, I think a lot of it comes down to the writing. I always say uh, the ones I did that were written by Richard Curtis mm-hmm. uh, partly worked because he was not only capable of writing extremely funny lines, you know, he's, he's a wonderful comedy writer, but he also was fascinated and obsessed with love. Uh, he it was just one of those guys that was always falling in love and then feeling terrible pain because it was unrequited or whatever. So all those things in his films about love are real. And I think you feel it. It's yeah. not formula. Um, right. It's still and within actually, the formula. And the same with, uh, I did a lot of romantic comedies written and directed by Mark Lawrence. And uh, again, brilliantly funny comedy writer, great funny lines. But for him, it was a real love of people. He, he properly loves people. I'm so jealous. I hate them. He really <laughs> loves them and right. uh, celebrates them. And so there's a sort of... Um, a real warmth that came through and, and which dissipates any sense of formula. Dissipates the formula. That's so interesting. You are still yeah. working within the structure, but almost overcoming it with... 
with, with something real, something from the heart. Yeah. And then you'd, the, the, the converse of that is I'd sometimes be sent in the old days scripts that were very Hollywood, and you could see that about six different writers had been drafted in. Right. And it hit the right beats. It sounded like a romantic comedy, but it was heartless. There's actually that's actually great advice too. Like as an actor, you need to you need to have a, a, almost a compass of what works as as a script and what doesn't. Like you're listening to some inner voice that needs to be honed, maybe and trained. Yeah, I always <laughs> I used to think I was brilliant at this. I used to say, oh, well, I don't know about my acting, mm. but I'm really good at choosing scripts because I just it would seem to me simple. I'm either entertained and moved or I'm not. Right. And uh, anyway, I lost that ability. Uh, about 10 years ago and started doing things that didn't work or turning down things that really did work. That was mm. equally painful. It's all part of the learning process, yeah. Well, I think what happens is uh, just fashion changes. It's odd. I, I mean, I used to work with uh, wonderful people in Hollywood who had impeccable taste and uh, made some brilliant, brilliant films, uh, award-winning films. And then those films are just not fashionable anymore. That's, it's right. just weird. They're the same talented people, but that's not fashionable. So fashion changes. Right, right. Thank you so much, Hugh. I got to let you go soon, but can I ask you some maybe silly backstage actorly questions? Yes. Like, for example, what is one? what do you think is one performance that every actor should see and why? Um... Well, for really brilliant film acting, I think Anthony Hopkins in Remains of the Day. Okay. He just, uh, by that stage, he was absolutely at his best. And mm. uh, and he's also, he's equally brilliant all round there in um, Howard's End. He's mm-hmm. sensational and all that. Wonderful ability to uh, think and then attack. And, um, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> suddenly go back into thought and then attack. I know the bounty he's wow. brilliant in as well. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, I think he, everyone should learn from Tony Hopkins. Well, that's sort of the other question. Do you have a favorite actor? Well, he's one. Yeah. Uh, Gene Ackman's one. You know, all the obvious ones. Robert Duvall and Robert De Niro. The, I mean, these guys are absolutely genius. Mm-hmm. Um, you used to speak about Meryl as, as obviously, as the legend that she is. Yeah. And then you, you worked with her. <laughs> so yeah. was that like a, um, did you learn a lot from that experience? Uh, I did, yeah. I learned two things. Uh, one is do it differently every time. Mm. Uh, She's one of those. One of those. Mm-hmm. Very impressive. All of them good. It would be impossible to choose their best take. Interesting. Uh, and the other thing is she she said she she told me that she vowed to herself once that she would always, throughout her career, do everything in her power to get in the emotional state that were required for the scene. And that is exhausting, you know. Yeah. So if it's an angry scene, Meryl disappears and she comes back angry. And if it's a happy scene, she comes back happy. If it's a sad scene, she comes back sad. And uh, very, very impressive. And uh, but you and, and right, you, you you can't fake it. I think. And right, yeah, 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 yeah. And somehow she's different kinds of anger in every take, in every angry take. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, crazy. But I mean, pro- insanely gifted. Like a, a Leonardo da Vinci, really, of acting. Amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. Mm. Um, last question. What it, we're all about advice. If you could go back in time, and of course you've touched on this, but if you could tell your younger self, maybe maybe the um, being segued into leading man younger self, one piece of advice, what would it be? Whether or not you would listen is another another story. Oh, it would be uh, it would be don't try and repeat what the the way you think you should say the line that you've rehearsed. Mm. Trust yourself to find it fresh. Mm. Listen to the other actor. Beautiful. Think a thought. Let the line play off that thought, rather than I know that if I put the emphasis on key, I will get. The laugh. You know that famous old uh, theatrical story amongst theatre actors in Britain. There's a guy who is in a long run of a comedy, and every night he gets a big laugh on "Can I have a cup of tea?" And then one night, six weeks in, he stops getting the laugh. Mm-hmm. And he, after a bit, he says to the other actors, "I don't understand. I always got a big laugh on Can I have a cup of tea?' And that's gone." And the old actor says, "Well, darling, try asking for the cup of tea and not the laugh." 
Uh-huh. And uh, that is so profound. Mm. As soon as you stop meaning it and having a thought, mm. it's weird. The audience smells it in parts of them they don't know exist, and it's not funny anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That's also why it really is comedy that's hard. Comedy is black and white. It has to either land or completely not land. Yeah, it's hideous like that. Yep. And on, on film, hmm. you have to kind of mean it. I remember being surprised in, uh, when we shot Four Weddings and a Funeral because I came from sort of sketch comedy. And so I had an idea of comic timing. And then there were a lot of serious actors in that who, who came from a serious acting and who just... Hmm kind of meant their lines. And I remember thinking, well, that won't work. No one's going to laugh at that. And actually, I was completely <laughs> wrong. Uh, mm. It was brilliant. If the line's funny enough, it's gonna, the comedy will take care of itself, and, and just meaning right. it was, was enough. Conviction, right. Yeah, yeah, you've got to mean it. Yeah. Wonderful. Are you an Thank actor, you so Jack? No, uh, I suppose more like a former actor. I, I trained. I trained as an actor. Uh-huh which I think Uh helps with these interviews. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) All right, it was very nice talking to you. Thank you. Oh, gosh, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Have a good one. All, all, All the best. And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. Hi guys, Christine McKenna Torella here, the Backstage Insider. A few weeks ago, I started the topic of auditions and I gave you an example of how to prepare for a scripted audition using Una Hagen's techniques. This week, I thought we would take a step back and address some of the underlining issues that could be preventing you from getting the audition in the first place. I call this doing a digital audit and I strongly encourage actors to do it at least once a year. The foundation of your digital toolkit is your headshot and resume. So when did you last get a headshot? Does it truly look like you right now? It's tempting to go for a glamour shot or you use a heavy hand with Photoshop, but that's not making a great headshot. A great headshot should be you on your best day. Resume. Make it clear, up to date and easy to read. Don't neglect your special skills section. It's important to get both of these right because it's the first impression it's the gateway to who you are as an artist so you want it to be accurate to you and your branding so now we have the foundation in place the next step to look at is your house right (laughs) and your house is your website right or your 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 reels and your videos together so your reel should be brief and include high quality audio and lighting. If I can't see you, if I can't see or hear you, I cannot connect with your performance. And then there is website. Do you have an online presence? I mean, the answer is yes, but what what are people saying about you, right? We've talked about this before, about making sure that you control what people see. So you can have a personalized domain that is your website, or if you're building that out or you're not ready to build a website and you're a bit budget conscious or you're new to the business, your backstage profile can be a complete shareable link, complete shareable profile of you as an artist because you can house unlimited media, headshots, resumes, etc. Right. So that's something to keep in mind. It's a reality, especially now that many industry folks are working virtually. You'll be Googled and searched for online. You want to be found and you want to control what they're saying. So that leads me to the Actors Toolkit. Backstage has launched a new series called the Actors Toolkit and we'll be discussing headshot, resume, reels and website as the first topics because it's foundational and there will be breaking down what to do, how to improve them and I'll be taking live questions from people, working one-on-one with actors and giving all the participants a workbook of actionable points and editorial to help inspire them to take action. I firmly believe that taking time to review and improve these four elements of your digital toolkit will have drastic results on the amount of auditions you receive and the amount of jobs you book from those auditions. So keep an eye out for the Actors Toolkit. Our first live class is on Tuesday, December 15th, 12pm Eastern Standard. On to the casting calls for this week. Hugh Grant was discussing The Undoing on HBO, so I thought I'd run with that theme. And we have three active 
castings for HBO on the site right now. One is for The Gilded Age, which is a new historical drama being shot in Sleepy Hollow, New York. I'm excited for its release date, which will be in 2021. If you want to be involved in making The Gilded Age, we have that casting call, so take a look. And staying with the U.S. region, for my non-union actors, there are the Straw Hat auditions for 2021. Just went on the site yesterday. Straw Hat is approximately 30 summer theaters, theme parks, and live entertainment production companies that register from around the country to cast their shows through Straw Hat each year. This year, they're looking for video submissions. So I think it's a great opportunity to get your face and your material reviewed by multiple producers and theaters at one time. That's all from me, Rick Leg, and all your auditions that are coming up. Thanks for listening and have a beautiful week. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.